Well, what you know, we do a molar ratio to get over here, and then convert until I can get molarity. So let's check this out. Start with what you know, uh, 20 milliliters, and just for convenience sake, let's change this to liters. So uh, 1,000 milliliters in the denominator, a liter in the numerator. So that will be liters now. Now I'm going to use that molarity that we, I was given, 2.0. Molarity means moles per liter, and if you multiply by that, you're going to get rid of the liters, and now you're just left with moles of the ammonium hydroxide. Now this reaction is balanced, but for completeness, I'm going to write out that there's one mole of HCl for every one mole of ammonium hydroxide. And you'd want to show this work on the test, so we know what you, uh, we think we know that you know what you're doing. And so the moles will cancel, and now we're left with moles, using the molar ratio, moles of HCl. Cool, we're almost there. Remember, molarity is moles per liter. So we've got the moles, actually. We've just got to divide by the volume. So let's divide by the 30 milliliters that was given. The only problem with that is uh, I've got 30 milliliters, but I need a liters. So let's change this to units of liters. Divide by 1,000 milliliters and multiply by 1 liter. And there we go. Whatever the answer to that is, is going to be uh, the answer to your question. Uh, that'll be the molarity of the unknown HCl. Okay, let's erase this. Okay, let's uh, do a little bit of chapter 6 stuff. You'll definitely want to know the characteristics of gases, meaning they have an indefinite shape and volume, they can expand and compress, etc., etc. Take a look at all those uh, general generalities about properties of gases. Uh, and then there's kind of two formulas in the first section. You saw pressure equals force per unit area, which we won't really use, but out of that you can get pressure is density times gravity times height. Uh, You'll use this formula right there, the pressure area equals density times gravity times height, for liquids especially. So if you got a liquid and they're asking about pressure, you're going to use this one. This would be the density of liquid. G would be uh, 9.81 meters per second squared. So you'd be given, uh, given that constant on the test, and then height would be the depth of the liquid itself. And I would recommend for this problem, and really, pretty much any, almost any problem from now on, except for gas laws, to use SI units. Uh, just out of convenience, it's a little bit easier. Uh, also take a look at a manometer and barometer and just review what those things are. And then you'll see what we did next in Chapter 6 was the kinetic theory of gases. You'll want to know the five assumptions, which are in your text, in the reader, or wherever, about the kinetic theory of gases. Like gases are tiny, and they take up effectively no volume. They move in rapid straight lines, that sort of thing. Uh, in this section, there was a couple equations that kind of came out uh, under the kinetic theory of gases. Let me write these underneath here. Um, the kinetic energy is equal to 3 halves RT, which is also equal to 1 half M u uh, squared. It's really u squared bar, bar being an average. That's the kinetic energy. Those are two formulas that came out. Uh, another thing we also learned, or were able to drive, is PV is proportional to uh, NT, or essentially we drive the ideal gas law. And through experiment, uh, it's equal to NRT. So R is just some proportionality constant. So we're able to derive that and a couple other things. Also, uh, a couple equations that came out of here. I, which is the momentum or the impulse, sometimes in the next chapter that symbolized P for momentum, that equals mass times uh, velocity. Uh, and then uh, collision frequency collision frequency is so collision frequency is proportional to 
velocity times capital N over V. Capital N is the number of particles. V is the volume. So when we put it together with pressure, said, well, pressure is proportional to the impulse or momentum, capital I, times the collision frequency. And that's mostly conceptual. These formulas, you're not going to use mathematically in this chapter. They were just conceptual things that we needed to derive the ideal gas law. Uh, some other equations you saw in this chapter were the root mean square velocity is 3RT over M. This is effectively a derived from this, these two equations right here. And then we had Graham's law, which is the property of A over the property, say, of gas B equals the inverse of the molar masses. And this is true uh, for four different uh, properties. That would be distance, amount, velocity, uh, and time. But time has a little asterisk in that you don't invert the molar masses for time. Okay, so those, all those formulas came out uh, in this section. Uh, except for these down here, you'll want to be able to use all the rest of them mathematically. Uh, in a moment, I might do an example. But except for the gas laws, which here's one example right here, you're gonna, I recommend SI units for all these. It just makes the problems easier. Okay? Otherwise, for the gas law problems, which I'll talk about in just a little bit, uh, you're... You're not going to, the gas law problems, it's a little easier not to use SI units. Though you could if you wanted to. It doesn't matter to me. Okay, a little bit about the real gas before I do an example. The real gas, uh, it basically those five assumptions break down for the kinetic theory of gases. So things change a little bit. And we went over, and you'll see in your text and the reader, the Van der Waals uh, equation of state, or real gas, which is one of the real gas equations of state based on a couple uh, assumptions, but uh, take a look at the properties that cause something to be a real gas. Uh, you should see that in your notes and elsewhere. And then, you know, one thing we did is like the compressibility factor. If you had an ideal gas and you calculated this number, you should get a 1. But for a real gas, you're not going to get a 1 here. It'll be something larger or smaller than 1. So that's how you can tell if something's a real gas or an ideal gas. Okay. So that's all that stuff. Let me just do uh, an example or so, just so you can see how some of these equations are used. Won't be able to use all of them, but we can do a little bit. Uh, you know, you can pick any gas. Uh, let's say you pick methane, CH4, uh, and you can find uh, URMS for that gas. That would just be 3 times R, and again, we're using SI units, so 8.3145 joules per mole Kelvin, uh, and then T, let's just say it's 273 Kelvin, divided by the molar mass, which you would say, oh, that's 12.01 for carbon, plus 4 times uh, 1.008 for the hydrogen, and that's cool. However, uh, that's not in SI units, because that's grams per mole for the molar mass. So you need to, uh, let me just extend these a little bit, multiply by uh, 1 kilogram per 1,000 grams in the denominator to change the molar mass to kilograms per mole. Uh, then you can do the calculation. This is the most common mistake to forget that for, for students. Okay, So remember to use SI units. It's essentially that. You can calculate that out for fun. Now, let's say you are comparing CH4 with, say, helium or something, okay? And uh, you wanted to get, say, the ratio of a fusion rates or something like that between these two. So now you're comparing two things. And when it's two things, we're going to use Graham's Law. When it's one thing that has to do with the rate, you're going to use this equation. Two things, you go into Graham's Law and... They'll ask you for a ratio, or sometimes they'll give you one of, say, the rates, and they'll ask you for the other rate, something like that. So you go, okay, the rate or velocity of CH4 over the rate or velocity of helium in a specified time period for a specified amount 
Sí, 